everyone and good morning to you all. Um, I welcome you all to this next session of the Brainwave series uh, for the learners of the Vai Patil uh, Vidya Peet Center for Online Learning, Pune. Our guest today is Mr. Vinod Krishman, the General Manager of Arbindo Pharma Limited. He will talk to us about le learning leadership culture and to begin the session, I would like to begin with a quote. Uh, nothing great will be achieved with, uh, without great men, and men are only great if they are determined to be so. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with this quote, I would like to say that with the guidance of our um, Honorable Chancellor, Sir Dr. P. D. Patil, um, Dr. Mrs. Bhagyashree Patilman, who is our Honorable Pro Chancellor, and uh, Mr. N. J. Pawar, Dr. N. J. Pawar, Sir, who's our Vice Chancellor, these people have developed this organization as. Um, as a magnificent organization, it has grown manifold in the last few years. It is Dr. P.D. Patil's uh, philanthropy that inspires us to bring more to you guys and so that you guys can become better human beings and good learners. Um, our Honorable Trustee and Executive Director, Dr. Mrs. Smita Zadav, has always been a source of inspiration to all of us. Now, with this, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Safi Faruki, ma'am, to uh, open the session for us. Give the welcome note. Very good morning to all of you. It gives me immense pleasure to extend to you all very warm greetings. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you all and brief you all about DPU Brainwave series. Today, together, as a family of DPU, we mark another landmark of success. And I am proud to inform you all that we have been imparting quality education through DPU corporate lectures and through Brainwave series. The main objective of these webinars series is to bridge the gap between the students and the industry and providing an extensive corporate exposure. It enhances the knowledge and exposure of MBA students to the real world life experiences through the rich and varied experiences of the speakers. So without taking much time, I warmly welcome our renowned speaker, Mr. Vinod Krishnanji, who in spite of his busy schedule has accepted our request and is here with us to share his valuable experiences and thoughts. Thank you, sir, and welcome to DPU Center for Online Learning. Yes. Oh. Thank you so much, you? Safiya. Right. Um, with, uh, with this, I'd now like to invite Dr. Yogesh Zazare to uh, give the welcome note uh, and introduce the guest speaker for us all. Uh, good morning, everyone. It gives me an immense pleasure to introduce today's expert speaker, Mr. Vinod Namit Krishnan, who is currently working as a general manager, learning leadership, culture, HR at Arubinda Pharma Limited. He holds a vast 23 years professional experience in which he has worked as a head HR and training at AG Bridge. Uh, he has also worked as a head learning and organization development and talent management in HR at AdLabs uh, Entertainment. Mr. Krishnan has also worked as a regional training manager at monster.com. His key contribution in the field of training and development includes leading, learning and organizational development functions and department for 11,000 employees across 13 global manufacturing and re research and development locations. His uh, another contributions includes driving strategic leadership development initiatives in partnership with Matthew institutions like IIM, ISB, CFI, KPMG. He has also conceptualized and launched Arubindo Online E-Learning Academy towards leadership development of 500 plus strategic talent with over 95% plus adoption rate over three years. He has also facilitated the chain management and operational excellence program in 12 manufacturing units spanning 10,000 employees. He has trained and certified 300 plus internal SMEs and trainers towards skill development and cascades of quality culture. Mr. Vinod Navnit Krishnan has also achieved an excellent academic uh, credits by acquiring 
diploma in hospitality and management from the Oberai School of Learning and Development. He has also acquired Lean Six Sigma belt from CIA Institute of Quality. He also holds certificate course on dynamic of employee relations. He has also the certified HR coach and winner at first place at private sector manufacturing BML Munjar awards for business excellence to learning and development. This is only the short introduction of Mr. Vinod Krishnan's. Today, we are fortunate to have a, such a highly experienced persons from the corporate world to share his knowledge and prof professional experience with us. So without taking too much of time, I welcome Mr. Vinod Navneet Krishnan's to deliver today's webinar on learning leadership culture. Sir, welcome, please. Thank you, Dr. Jazare, uh, Dr. Safia Faroqi, Professor Suhail, Professor Sandeep, Dr. P.D. Patel, Sir, Honorable Chancellor, uh, Dr. Mrs. Bhagishri Patel, Ma'am, Honorable Pro Chancellor, Dr. N.J. Pawar, Sir, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Smita Jadav, Ma'am, Executive Director and Trustee, and Dr. Saf Safia Faroqi, Ma'am, Director for the Center of Online Learning. I really thank you for this honor and privilege to be part of this wonderful Brainwave series. I think it's a great initiative on part of uh, the university to be able to connect the industry um, and academia together for the benefit of what i not only like to call students but the future of of the uh, of the globe i understand that we have students connecting from india africa and uh, various other parts of the globe so i really thank you for the opportunity and probably over the next 90 minutes or so we'd like to probably share um, some of our insights that we've seen growing up um, maybe less than 20 years ago we were uh, at the other end uh, a beneficiary of some of the best vocational as well as uh, academic education that we've been fortunate to receive. I think I can say that uh, I've been fortunate to be uh, led and coached by some of the best uh, academicians and the industry practitioners. So many things I'll be talking uh, to you today uh, will be borrowed from some of the collective experiences, uh, some of the industry research, uh, some of the literature study that we've picked up uh, that uh, we picked up over the years and be fortunate to be uh, bestowed upon. So without further ado, I'd just like to share screen. And uh, if you can see my screen, just give me a thumbs up. Let me know if you're able to see my screen. Yes, sir, we can see your screen. All right. So uh, once again, a uh, very warm welcome to all our students and academic fraternity who are part of this uh, DPU Brainwave series. When I was invited uh, to talk uh, about certain futuristic aspects that will be of interest, I sort of looked at a wordplay that said surfs up uh, to be able to help us navigate uh, some of the, the waves that we're about to see in life. Some of them a little turbulent, some of them a little temperate, but uh, waves nevertheless. So what we'll be looking to do today is to maybe give you a perspective over the next, say, 90 minutes to 120 minutes over three key aspects. Uh, one would be some outside in perspectives and sought after values and competencies. This will come from a great amount of research and also from some of the uh, sort of emerging trends that we've been seeing. Uh, we will delve a little deep into uh, the, the inside. Uh, we will conduct a very simple diagnostic, which will help us uncover some of our hidden interests and probably through that exercise, be able to give us a connectivity in terms of what we're doing and what we like to do and probably strike a harmonic balance. I've left the last section for a little bit of uh, Q&A because uh, I thought I'll pose a few questions which are not really to be able to measure whether the answers are right or wrong but hopefully they could be a discussion starter and it could help pave way to be able to bring about some of the key aspects that the industry is looking forward to today. So without further ado, I'd like to get started. Um, I thought we'll start with a little brain waiver. Um, what you can see on the screen is a simple question. Uh, if somebody could, could unmute and tell us what comes next, or maybe use the chat window, uh, give us the answer for this question. at the chat window let me see if there is yes so i as you can see nita has responded with six with the clues it's not six dr shikha has come up with a response 
Yashar has come up with a response. Divya has come up with a response. Anisha has come up with a response. Mansi has come up with a response. Perhaps I can request Dr. Shiksha to give us her perspective on what the right answer is. Dr. Shiksha is trying to say something. Dr. Shikha, sorry. Yes. Tanlakshmi Venkat has also got the right response. Nikhil Palke has got the right response. I like Sakshi's response, infinite, but I wish it were infinite. Right. The right answer is is R as in reverse. So you'll have to you'll have to visualize yourself driving a car, and I guess one, two, three, four, five, and R is the right response. Very well done. I think a few of you, if you uh, have the opportunity to unmute and talk, that'll be nice. There will be certain parts of the section where we'll request our, uh, you know, our academic uh, faculty to help us mute everyone so that we'll have a seamless interaction. But these are opportunities for us to interact. Yes, so the right answer is R. So a big round of applause. If there are some emojis, you can share that. So well done. So that's the right answer. Let's look at the next one. All right. What comes next? The clue is that it's not F. Akshay has given us a response. Can we get more responses? Shankar has given us a response. I guess this is right up your alley. So all of you are absolutely tuned in. That was the, the idea of this little brain waver so that we could all get connected. Fantastic. Akshay, if you'd like to mute and say hi and give us your response, since you were the first one to respond to this question. Hi, sir. Hi, Akshay. So what is Hello? your response? It's a vitamin K. Vitamin K, absolutely. It's vitamin A, B, C, D, E, and vitamin K. I guess as doctors, this is something that's right up your alley. So well done, Akshay. Big round of applause for you. Well done. Thank you, sir. Great. Great. I, uh, good responses, and that's what we'd like to have during this session because uh, the, the session is curated between all of us. There's, there's some perspective that, that I will be bringing in, like I said, which is which is largely learned through experience and a tribute to all our teachers and our uh, and our leaders that we worked with. Uh, and some of the aspects will be known to all of us as well. So maybe this interaction can just help cement uh, some of those key learnings, right? So these are some of the, the ground rules. And I think today's uh, digital interaction, digital learning, you'll know this better than, than I do. Uh, try keeping your videos on, at least during the interaction. Uh, let's have a participative uh, you know, moment here. It's about 90 minutes or so. So I guess we can try and enrich our own uh, perspectives on many of the concepts we're talking about. We really want you to speak up. We want to hear your views because there will be certain sessions which will be interactive. Uh, while we're not uh, interacting, it'll be good to stay on mute so that you know, there is no disturbance and we can flow through the session. And uh, I understand this is, a, this is an extreme digital world. So try and be there as much as you can. Great. The first session is going to be a little bit about the outside in perspective. I'd like to bring you some of the uh, well-known research on what is going to be some of the key sought after values and competency. What is going to be in vogue for the next five to seven years? This has come through some interesting literature study as well as some of the things that we're seeing in the industry and they corroborate. Uh, we can see a lot of uh, convergence between what the literature is talking about and what we see in our everyday life. Uh, for this, I'd like to request you to kindly uh, use your mobile phones or your computer and log on to menti.com and use this code 54975695. Use this code that you see on top of your screen to be able to log on to menti.com. And we'd like to hear your perspectives before we actually go into the literature study. Right? So log on to menti.com, www.menti.com and use this code that you see on your system. I'm going to leave this on for a for a minute so that you can probably take a screenshot as well. 
I'm going to leave this on for a minute so that everybody can get on. And then I'll go on to the, the page which will actually display the responses being given. I think it's wonderful to see over 300 participants have connected here today. So we'll get a very good perspective on what your take on what are some of the key values and competencies that will be in vogue in the near future, say for the next three to five years. I'll keep this on for another 15, 20 seconds and then I'll switch screen to see some of the responses. Going to stop sharing the presentation and I will share. Yes, we've already started getting responses. Yeah, that's nice. We're getting some good responses. Somebody says, I think that's health, artificial intelligence, learning, leadership, skill, technology ethics so as you would know with the, with this representation of word clouds is uh, the the words that you see in the larger font size are uh, the ones which are attracting most responses so for example leadership technology learning skills are the ones most people are going for. We have about 19, 20 respondents. We'll, we'll allow this to float for another couple of minutes because we have nearly had 300 people on the call today in this particular learning session, the Brainwave series. So technology, leadership, artificial intelligence, health. That's very interesting that you talk about health. Education. <laughs> AI, I can see AI. Hard work, somebody speaks about. Yeah, so some things never, uh, never fade. Hard work continues to be important. Somebody says smart work in opposition to that. Research. Warfare, somebody says. I hope we can turn that to welfare. Okay, we have about 50 responses. That's about one sixth of the room. Leadership is coming through, technology is coming through in a big way. <laughs> Cryptocurrency, I can see, yes. Make in India, data science. Communication, somebody's talking about communication. Interesting, we will touch upon that today. Teamwork, I can see. Trust, Bitcoin, 72 people there. About one-fifth of the room has responded. Great, so you have about, and you can keep giving multiple responses. So we have about 82 people who have responded so far. Some are responding on the chat, I guess. You can, you can give it a go. You can give menti.com a go because if you're able to connect on this session, you'll be able to sort of get your voice of opinion on the screen and that will help us navigate the skills going forward. Right, so if, when we touch 100, we will look to summarize. So three, two away from a century, one away, and that's a century. Fantastic. So we've got 100 odd responses from all of you there, and the responses keep flowing in. That's fantastic. We can always come back here after a little while to see, uh, you know, what are, in your opinion, in your collective opinion, uh, what, what are going to be some of the key values and competencies that will be in the near future? You know, somebody asked me, you know, what do you, how do you differentiate between values and competencies? You know, it's very difficult to, to explain in lexicon, uh, but somebody told me this and I'll, I'll probably just narrate what they said. Uh, you have two drivers who are driving to the airport. Uh, you have about 30 minutes to get to the airport to catch the flight. 
both extremely competent drivers. One of them decides to break all the signals, overtake from the left, and gets you there in about 27 minutes. And one decides to use his or her skills as a driver, play by the rules, get you there safely, probably in 27 minutes as well. And that's probably one of the key differentiators, differentiators between values and competencies. Competencies talks about how well you can do the task that you're given at hand. The values talk about how you can do it in an ethical, moral, socially acceptable manner. So both of these are going to be extremely important as we go ahead in the future. It's not only about how capable you are at doing something, but how you can do it by adhering to some of the social values and some of the values that you will see involved in the organization. So fantastic. We have 127 responses and we see technology, communication, empathy, health, leadership, artificial intelligence, skills, robotics, data science, creativity. These are some of the key values and competencies that you have put out for. Let me bring up the research study on this and you'll be very happy to see that many of you have got some of the key values and competencies in book. I will bring back my presentation. So thank you for being such a participative audience. Let's take a look at what the research has to say. This is the LinkedIn study of uh, what are the key soft and hard skills that are in vogue for the next, say, three to five years. I'll start with the hard skills because uh, that's something that's probably a little easier to relate to. Many of you spoke about artificial intelligence. Many of you spoke about uh, you spoke about blockchain, cloud computing, they're all there. Business analytics, this becomes an important aspect. Sales becomes an important aspect as you use opportunities of technology, but they still have to be viable to the end consumer. So everything that we're doing today, uh, if you're using a certain kind of analytics to be able to order food at home, uh, it's really important that the customer values that and uses that analytics to be able to make a purchase whether it is through tomato, swiggy, or any of the uh, aggregators that you find available. But what we like to look at on the left-hand side is something called a soft skills. And um, I'd like to share a small video uh, by a very popular author, researcher, consultant. You would probably know of this gentleman. His name is Simon Sinek. And I'll share a video which gives us a little bit more insight onto hard skills and soft skills and we'll come back and look at this. Let's watch this video. I hope it's audible. If somebody can give me a thumbs up, it's audible. I have a pet peeve. I hate the term soft skills. Um, there's nothing soft about them. You know, and when we talk about hard skills and soft skills as if they're in opposition to each other, that they're, which is nonsense. It's hard skills and human skills. Hard skills are the, the, the skills I need to do my job and human skills are the skills I need to be a better human being. And it's the skills of it's being, and human skills are the skills that make better leaders. And you're 100% right. So I had the opportunity to spend time with the Navy SEALs, which is a very high performing organization. And I spent time with the head of training for the Navy SEALs. And they have an elite group within the Navy SEALs. Um, and I asked him, how do you choose who gets into that elite group? And he drew up uh, on a graph, a, uh, uh, on a piece of paper, uh, uh, an X, Y axis, performance versus trust. And the way they define performance is the way we define performance. Do you hit your numbers? It's all the stuff that we're used to measuring, right? Um, the way they define uh, trust is what kind of person are you? Um, the, way, the way they put it is I may trust you with my life, but do I trust you with my money or my wife? I mean, they're seals. Anyway, the, what he was explaining to me is that uh, uh, clearly uh, nobody, wants, uh, nobody wants the low performer of low trust down here, clearly, nobody wants that person, right? Clearly, everybody wants the high performer of high trust. Of course, that's what everybody wants. What they, what they learned is that the high performer of low trust is a toxic team member. And they would actually rather have a medium performer of high trust, sometimes even a low performer of high trust, it's a relative scale, over the high performer of low trust. Now, if you think about it in business, we have a million metrics to measure someone's performance, 
and we have negligible to zero metrics to measure someone's trustworthiness. And so we accidentally keep promoting toxic team members to become toxic leaders who are driven by self-interest predominantly um, and not, are not uh, 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 people who we ne necessarily trust. We may like them, we may get along with them, but we don't trust them. Um, uh, uh, the amazing thing is it's unbelievably easy to identify these people in a team. Okay, so I hope you found that uh, that interesting. And you know what he goes on to talk about is uh, how easy it is to identify these people who are low on trust and high on performance. Is that if you just go about and ask anybody, you know, who they want to least work with, and probably all of them will point in the same direction. And in the same power lots, if you ask them who they like to most work with, who probably doesn't bring you know, the highest amount of talent or the highest amount of performance. But if you want somebody there at 11 o'clock at night to be able to guard that door, if you want somebody there at six in the morning to be able to pick up that first mail, they're the people that the organization as well as the teams are most likely to go to. So when you look at these, um, you know, this little piece of research, I want you to look at the right-hand side first and look at it from a point of saying that this is a entry ticket into employment uh, many of you would probably join organizations. Many of you probably have organizations of your own. It could be a family-driven business that is looking for your skill set to move to the next level. You may be the next generation entrepreneur. Uh, many of you may want to start on your own. Either ways, it doesn't matter. We're all going to be part of organizations. That's very important to remember. And what you see on the, on the right-hand side um, can be learned, can be excelled, or could be outsourced. You could have any of these three combinations or more. So what you see on the right-hand side here in terms of the hard skills is something which you cannot do without. And that becomes your entry point into business. That becomes your entry point to competition. That is your entry point into an organization. What you see on the left-hand side is what is going to catapult you to the next level. And that's why we've renamed that as top five human skills. And many of you spoke about it. Many of you spoke about teamwork. I could see that being highlighted there. That's collaboration. Many of you spoke about creativity. The second one is probably a very interesting one. The last two years, persuasion has become a very, very strong skill set. Because if you look at the pandemic, you look at uh, the way COVID has changed the, the entire topography, and I'm very glad to see that most things are coming back to normal, right from our homes, right from our little children to the adults, to the elder ones, we've had to persuade each one of us to be able to adopt and adapt, adopt to some of these new things that we have to do. Wear a mask, keep sanitizing yourself, maintain social distancing. At the same time, adapt because we've had to keep the show going. The organizations have to move on, families have to move on. You've got to do it with a better health and safety network. You've got to do it with a better understanding of what humans need. And persuasion has been the key, right from the heads of states of various countries to the medical fraternity. We've had to constantly persuade people to be able to do certain things. Today, I believe we've crossed over 100 crore in terms of our uh, vaccination count. And that's happened through sheer persuasion. Uh, it didn't take off as fast as we thought. We had to be persuaded to stay indoors for nearly 60 days, 90 days before we could start moving out. So that becomes a, an extremely important aspect. Look at the third one. I'd like to tell you a small story here. And this I heard uh, as a part of a YouTube video. You can go through it. Apparently, about nearly about 30 years ago, uh, the great giant Apple and uh, Steve Jobs did was at the helm at that point in time, pretty much figured out the hardware. Uh, they had the Apple Macintosh, they were doing really well, and they figured out the hardware part of it. Somehow, they weren't able to crack the software. And the best minds at Apple uh, were at it, really committed team, wonderfully talented people. They all were doing their best. Somehow, they could not get up to that next level of, uh, you know, the uh, software. And what we're talking about is the graphical user interface. Uh, probably many of you have seen this video and probably guessing where I'm going with this. One of the things Steve Jobs decided to do was pick up the phone and call whom? Actually call Bill Gates. Picked up the phone, spoke to Bill, conveyed his problem, and lo and behold, you, there was a team from Microsoft headed by Bill Gates 
who are out there to be able to help out uh, the team at Apple. And there's a wonderful interview on YouTube. Maybe I'll share the link uh, with, with Professor Soil and you'll be able to share that with all of you. Is that um, you don't have to play a zero-sum game. You don't have to put somebody down in order to, to go up. Uh, the reason that you have some of the probably the best computing today in the industry and you see some of the best uh, you know advent in terms of technology, probably that marked one, one important episode uh, in management thought as well as forethought is that the two competitors came together and uh, the team at Microsoft actually helped Apple uncover their problems and they did help them along the journey of the user interface, the graphical user interface that you see with Windows today. But obviously Windows mastered it and went forward, but Windows probably got their hardware game in much, much later. So it's, an, it's a true story, a true life story of how uh, many of the people have been able to collaborate. And this takes for a little amount of learning it takes for a little amount of higher order thinking. It takes for you to work with good mentors and good coaches who are able to hone them. So long story short, what you see on the left-hand side is probably something that is going to take us a little bit more time, a little bit more growth, and a little bit more maturity. If some of us possess this as, as we enter the workforce or enter the industry, that's fantastic because you're going to find uh, your journey or navigation that much more easier if you're able to pick up some of these skills. So this was 2020. For 2021, what we decided to do was we went and researched some of the best perspectives from industry thought leaders. We went and saw some of the things that the leading organizations in the world like Fidelity, Hayes Global, WorkHuman, MasterCard, Ernst & Young, all of them are talking about. So I picked up a few quotes uh, you know, from the industry leaders and spoke about what are some of the key values and competencies that are going to be in demand as we move forward uh, in life. And adaptability came out as the number one. I mean, we spoke about the pandemic and we spoke about uh, how things have changed. This interaction probably would have been happening in, in the illustrious campus uh, with us probably sitting in a nice convention hall and probably uh, the capacity of the convention hall would uh, determine the number of people who could attend. But I think today that we've embraced technology and learning Many people from across the globe are able to attend this session and do it with the comfort of their homes or wherever they are and do it for that period of time. So, you know, you're able to cut travel and you're able to do all of that. The other aspect is um, I was trying to research saying that, okay, it's great to say that you need to be adaptable, but how do you learn adaptability as a, as a skill? Because you can learn blockchain, you can go and study with someone, but how do you learn adaptability? One of the things that, that came out is that um, our education system is, is about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. There's a concept called STEAM, S-T-E-A-M, and A stands for arts. One of the best ways to learn adaptability is to probably practice a form of art. It could be sports, it could be dance, it could be music, because one of the things that's constant in, in every art form is change. Uh, when you play sport, the outcome is not determined at the start. When you practice some sort of a dance, you practice some sort of music, practice any form of art, it requires for you to stay nimble and requires for you to stay adaptable and be ready for change. And that's probably leading us from our first competency to the second competency. If you possess adaptability, you will be able to facilitate change and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a saying in life, my father loves to use this saying that there's nothing constant in this world, except you can probably all shout it out from where you are, change. So we're in a world that is changing faster and faster with every decade. If you saw the 1900s, the 1950s, what was achieved then was then achieved further in the next 20 years. What was achieved up to the 1970s was achieved probably in the next 10 years. And that's how quickly generations are moving. Gen X would probably be about 30 years, Gen Y about 15 years, and then moving forward, we're seeing a generation change every five to seven years. So the kind of uh, adaptability that is required and the ability to facilitate change is going to be extremely important. Uh, you know, my, my head of HR, he says this uh, extremely, quickly. he says that if you change after change, you will survive. You change along with change, you will 
succeed. But if you can be the cause of change, you will lead. So it's going to be one of the most important facets for all of us in the next 10 years to be able to look at our ability to change. So this starts from maybe many aspects in our personal life to our professional life is we, if we can use this as a trigger to be able to say that if you can be the cause of change, you will lead. And that's what we, we really hope that many of us who are part of this session can be leaders of tomorrow and we can we can regale and you know really rejoice in your leadership and the things that you're going to create for the world tomorrow. The third aspect, I'm not sure many of you have thought of this, is data visualization. Uh, we spoke about uh, some of these you know, online aggregators. If you were to order uh, something from Amazon today, you will know when that is going to get delivered to you. But if you were to order something from Zomato, you would be able to see that something is 18 minutes away, 16 minutes away, it's entered your doorstep, and now it's getting delivered, whether it's been delivered early or whether it's been delivered on time. Organizations are going to look at building in more and more interactive tools, right from the customer to the supply chain end, right from order receiving to order fulfillment and all the other value stream processes in between. Uh, I've had the good opportunity to work with a healthcare organization and I've had the opportunity to work with, uh, with hospitals, with laboratories. I work with a pharma organization today. And one of the advents and one of the things that our management is trying to do is to be able to look at how do you digitalize every step in the value stream, right? From converting a raw material to a finished good or converting in an order acceptance to final customer fulfillment. Every stage requires for the data to be visualized so that you can organizations can look at uh, taking decisions. Data is the new oil. And with good data, you can start making better decisions. You'll be able to make, you may, may be able to start with certain amount of descriptive or certain amount of prescriptive uh, processes. But the whole idea is to start making it more predictive and saying that if I can look at a series of data, can I start predicting what is the efficacy of my process or how well my process will do tomorrow. Let's take, let's take an example. Uh, you're looking at uh, taking an airline, you want to go from uh, say Pune or Mumbai, you want to go to Delhi. Uh, this happened in the US nearly 30, 25 or 30 years ago, but using data, you're able to talk about the on-time performance of an airline. Maybe one year of data will tell you that this particular airline, XYZ airline, the on-time performance is 99.6% versus the on-time performance of another airline is 98%. Now you tell me as a customer, which one are you likely to, to take? I think it's a, it's a no brainer. We probably will all go with the, uh, with the numbers that are slightly more stronger towards ensuring that we complete our journey. Now this is data visualization to be able to help the customer make a more uh, informed decision and customer satisfaction is going to be the key aspect going forward. So when we talk about our ability to visualize data, it talks about our, uh, our, um, our understanding, our intuitive approach to be able to look at both uh, regression or you know, what you have in, in history and able to project and predict what is likely to happen uh, in the future. Uh, I'm not talking about us being um, you know, soothsayers, but somebody who's able to use historical data and build trend so that you can see whether you're moving forward or backwards. I mean, if you were to watch a, a cricket match today, just by looking at the buildup of the run rate uh, versus the asking rate, you'll be able to pretty much talk about whether the team is on track, behind track, or ahead of the track. So that gives us the opportunity to make better decisions as organizations. We've spoken about the three of them. I'll come to the fourth one, which uh, I think some of you spoke about. You spoke about empathy. You spoke about uh, building relations. And emotional intelligence is going to be one of the key aspects for us going forward. You know, emotional intelligence is not just about being nice to people. Um, it's about helping oneself handle stress in healthier ways. We are all going to be put to test in the next say five to 10 years, because this is a generation that is not going to come with 
one or two percent of people who have extraneous knowledge. Maybe 50 years ago, you would have a small percentage of people who have um, access to education, higher order education, but the kind of access we have today, uh, you know, you can pick, pretty much pick up any concept that you like, and you can go ahead and learn that concept or even teach that concept by simply the power of Google or various search engines that you have to be able to get you that knowledge. So knowledge per se is not going to be the differentiating factor. In fact, everything that I'm speaking about today, you can go online and you can probably get 80, 90% of it. Maybe five, 10 percent is coming through, like I said, all the good knowledge that we've received from our leaders and some of our own uh, personal experiences. But what we find is making it increasingly difficult for a lot of knowledgeable people to navigate the workspace is their emotional intelligence. We see a lot of knowledgeable people crumble against the first confrontation that they get. Many times we believe that the idea that we moot that comes from great amount of research, great amount of what I study, what we study needs to be palatable or needs to be accepted by people instantly. Well, friends, that's probably the toughest part. And we're going to talk about this in our second part when we, when we talk about uh, you know, some of the key challenges that we're likely to face when we hit the industry is that's just the first part. And you'll find that many people are able to come to that stage in terms of saying that I have that adequate knowledge. But to weather that storm, that's why we call the session Surf's Up, is we will get plenty of waves of confrontation, conflict, many doors getting closed. Your ability to be able to soak in that pressure, soak in that stress is going to be determined by your nurturing of emotional intelligence. You know, somebody um, spoke to uh, the Dalai Lama once, and there's nothing, uh, nobody else, and Daniel Goldman, who's supposed to be the father of emotional intelligence. And he spoke to the Dalai Lama and he asked him, he said, you've been through a tumultuous journey. And some of you who, started, who read about the Dalai Lama would know that he moved from a war-ridden uh, country to a very, very peaceful establishment that he created on his own. And he asked him, he said, how are you able to maintain such calm uh, when you are up against, you know, some of the most hostile situations in the world and some of the hostile situations in here? And he said that it all begins with me knowing what's going on inside of me. And that in itself can be a massive journey for many people. To be able to understand oneself, to be able to understand what are some of the trigger points for my happiness, for my sadness, for my turbulence, is a journey in itself. So I really request all of our people who are gathered here to be able to invest a certain amount of time. And there are various, you know, organizations and many of your faculty members can can guide you in trying to help establish a connect within oneself and that's probably going to be the first starting point for emotional intelligence and if there is a hierarchy it starts with self-awareness and then moves to self-regulation because there are some moments when we're not able to maintain our uh, demeanor whether it's happiness or sadness or any other kind of emotional uh, you know situation that we're going through so from self-awareness to self-regulation to social awareness, social regulation. And that would be the journey for us to start becoming more emotionally intelligent. So our intelligence quotient now needs to have both IQ as well as EQ for us to be able to navigate this world that we're, we're talking about. And the last aspect, among many other aspects, I picked up these five because I thought for a very, very knowledgeable, extremely well-taught because you're, work, you're studying with one of the best universities. Uh, I thought I'll bring in some slightly different perspectives which you can work for yourselves on. The last bit is going to be lifelong learning. Uh, many of us complete our graduation by the end of 21. Some people go in for post-graduation. Some people decide to do something on their own and come back. But most likely by 25 or 27, we're done with our education. Somebody finishes at 23, somebody at 25, somebody at 27. Uh, today, we're not even talking about retirement. There's 31 years of work to go, and then many people continue to do a lot of things after that. So we're talking about 40 to 50 years of, uh, you know, hardcore vigil. And we spoke about the kind of changes that you will see five to seven years. Just ask yourself, it's 27 years of education going to be able to fulfill what is going to be probably a career of 40 to 50 years. And it is not 
a life of one career. It's going to be a lifetime of careers, you know, where you go through various kinds of transitions as you move through 50 years. Imagine this, it's like saying that I'm going to spend my whole day with just what I've eaten for breakfast, or I'm going to spend my whole week of what I just had on Monday. I'm going to spend the whole month on what I've just eaten on the first of the month. So you realize that over a period of time, um, you have to keep renewing yourself. And that's something that we do as an organization. We ensure that all of us are uh, going in and learning that one extra skill or going in and exploring something that we've not been exposed to before. And that's a, that's a pledge that you make saying that I learned something new this year or I learned, some, I learned two things new this year. That just helps you stay grounded. It, it tells you that you know, there's a lot more that you need to know. And you know, uh, you know it's, it's, I have an adage that says, uh, the more you know, the more you don't. Because if you, if, if, if you feel that what you've acquired already is the end all and the be all, and that becomes an opportunity for us to start getting blinded. We want to remove that opportunity and replace it with another lens of opportunity saying that there's still more for me to uncover, there's still more for me to learn. So these were the five things uh, apart from what we saw on the LinkedIn survey that uh, are some of the key sought after competencies and values. Uh, lifelong learning is a value, which says that I'm going to commit to telling myself that I still have more to know, I still have more to uncover. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about in this session. Um, I'll probably take a couple of minutes for any questions or any thoughts or any suggestions before we move to our next session, which is going to be a very uh, interactive as well as it's going to be a deep dive within your uh, system. So Professor Sandeep, if you want to facilitate um, a couple of minutes of discussion, we'd be happy to do that. Uh, yes, sir. So how are we doing on time? Uh, we have maybe about 45 minutes or one hour to go. Yes, sir. I've got a little stopwatch here that's guiding me. So if you have any thoughts, any discussions, anybody would like to uh, bring out any point, anything that struck a chord with you, we'd be happy to listen. I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment just so that I can see some of the faces if there are any. All attendees can uh, raise their hand. I will unmute one by one. If they uh, wish to discuss anything, just raise your hand. I will unmute you one by one. Right. So, um, learners, I would like you guys to raise your hands in case if you'd like to ask a question to Mr. Vinod Krishnan. Right, I have a question in the chat box, Mr. Krishnan from uh, Sandesh. Um, sure. And Sandesh is asking what is the benefits of, uh, what are the benefits of the long, uh, uh, benefits of lifelong education? Yeah. You know, it's a, um, it's a wonderful aspect that you're talking about. Um, if, you, if you were to look at any facet of life today, uh, maybe Sandeep, is it Sandesh who, who asked the question? Sandesh. Sandesh, if you can type in your favorite uh, vocation, whether it's a profession or a sport or anything like that, if you can just type in that, it will help us make it more uh, relevant to you. What's your favorite thing that you like to do? It could be a career, it could be a sport, it could be uh, any other aspect of life. Social work, teaching. teaching. Social work, wow. You've touched You've touched probably the most interesting aspect. I think Professor sohail has got a lovely smile on his, on his face. I mean, imagine this. Imagine the teachers, if they hadn't picked up technology or they were averse to technology. One of the first things that the government did, um, you know, was the program to be able to reteach teachers on how to use technology to be able to engage children when the COVID pandemic reached. Imagine if I were to say that I think uh, connecting with students in person is the only way to learn, is the only way to teach. And there's no question. I mean, seeing each other in the flesh and being together is the best way, there's no question. But what if you're separated by a pandemic and you refuse to accept the kind of technology and the kind of breakthrough 
that can help you connect with the students. That is a classic example. Today, many of the teachers, if you ask them, they struggled for the first one month. You know, there were a lot of uh, memes going around. Somebody's got the video off and the audio on. Somebody's got the audio on and the video off. Somebody's got both off or both on. They were all nice things to say, but really teachers struggled during that first one month. And then afterward, we started hearing parents say, you know, the kind of efforts teachers are putting in to really learn this new aspect of teaching is a classic example of lifelong learning. Uh, and you spoke about social work. We'll touch about that when we come a little later. We have another question from someone. Right. Um, I see that uh, Akshay Marjan has raised his hand. Akshay, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, hi, sir. Um, Akshay. Uh, this is Christian from uh, DRC. So okay, I would like just to know. I would like just to know what can be the qualification uh, so that the, the person can be uh, quick at adaptability, at, at, at adaptation. So in terms of uh, the human skills that uh, uh, the, the professor has just shared with you, with us. That's a, that's a wonderful question, Christian. And uh, I asked this question to myself when I was, I was preparing the session and I spoke to a few people read a few aspects saying that adaptability uh, is something that's very difficult for you to learn through a textbook or through a certain cognitive course. Uh, it, is, it is bestowed in the aspect of arts. Uh, if you learn to play a sport or if you learn to pick up a piece of art, it could be dance, it could be music, it could be any form of art. Art has this natural ingrained value of adaptability. Because what you do today is not going to help you tomorrow. What you do now is not going to help you the next moment. You've got to be in the moment. If you play any sport, do you play any sport, Christian? Do you play, do you play some soccer or do you, do you, are you into athletics or do you play some cricket or some hockey or volleyball? Do you, do you play any of these uh, sports, Christian? Christian, do you play any sport at all? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Ping pong. You play ping pong. That there's no, yes. there's probably no faster game for you to adapt because say you won the last point, there's no guarantee that you're going to win the next point. Say you've you've you've, you've backhand sliced your opponent for the first set, there's no guarantee that that's going to help you in the second set because he's already picked up on that little trait of yours. So that's very important. So you got to stay nimble. You got to stay adaptable. And if you play a sport and when you face a life situation where you try something and it does not work, there is, there is an auto reset button that, that starts getting built. And, uh, you know, you probably, I'll, I'll suggest one or two books that you can read. It's called The Brain. It says that, you know, we have synapses in our brain and everything that we do to nurture these synapses help us in a moment that we have to take decisions. And if you were to nurture your synapses with a lot of art, it's going to help you in taking these life, uh, you know, sort of life altering decisions or the challenges that you get uh, posed with. Many times I see that people who are really, um, you know, good sportsmen or people who follow sports really well, don't get very, very perturbed with challenges because they know it's part of life. So uh, it's also a cue to the next question that somebody was uh, asking is adaptability and change management go hand in hand. It's like two sides of the coin. You can't facilitate change until you're adaptable. And change needs for you to be adaptable. And that's what is the core ingrainment of, of change. The fact that you know there is going to be change helps you take, a, take that on even better. I hope it answered your question. And that's a lovely insight. So, um, um, there, there are a few questions that have actually come up, uh, you know, and it actually um, is from one of the most interesting ones from John Lukwesa, uh, from uh, one of our African learners. He is asking, what is the best way to master change management? Yeah, practice it is probably the best way to, to, to master it, you know. Uh, you know, many of us, uh, there is there's this adage in change management. It's, it's also very important 
in project management. It's called P. Uh, P stands for plan, do, check, and act. That's that's a four stage process for simple change management. Many people say PDCA stands for please don't change anything. So that's one one uh, you know group or one school of thought says that please don't change anything. We were recently having a discussion at home where we had to change the position of the couch, and uh, I'm talking to you so much about change management. I was against it. I, mean, I had my my reasons for it, but I was against it. So. Many times you're faced with situations which are in life, which asks you for you to change a certain aspect of your life or a certain comfort that you're in. And we practice this in organizations a lot and homes a lot where you've got to be comfortable in negotiating or communicating your point of view. And when we speak with leaders, many times we go with an agenda to change saying that, okay, I think we need to change the way we are reviewing something or change the way we are doing something. And if we're open to a negotiation or we're open to having a discussion, many times a third option emerges, a third option that is comfortable to both parties, or at least it is amenable to both parties, and that itself becomes an aspect of going forward. Um, I think uh, if Jennifer, who was asking the question, is that John. John, yes, John, I think one of the things I can say to you is that uh, this is going to become a very strong part of life, especially for technocrats, uh, for people who are extremely uh, left brain and people who come with a very strong acumen in technology, for, for one to be able to let that go and then move to another form of technology or another stream of management is going to be a challenge. And I see that because it happened to all of us because we come with a certain school of thought. And if you want to be able to just let that go and uh, you know navigate to another school of thought, that is, that is a challenge and it requires for us to develop a lot of uh, internal fortitude to be able to negotiate uh, that change, which is why I put that up as some of the key skills because those are not those aren't skills that you can learn uh, through a lexicon or you can Google or you go to the best faculties. You need a good guru. You need, you need, uh, you know, uh, you need a lot of Dr. Safia Farooqis and Dr. Sohails who are going to help you uh, understand what are some of the key uh, elements that will help you navigate from what you're comfortable today to PDCA, please, please don't change anything, to plan to check and act. So that takes for a certain amount of, you know, surrender as a mechanism. Thank you so much uh, for your insight, uh, Mr. Krishnan. Um, there, there are a lot of questions that are actually flowing in. Um, I think we can move on with the with the session so that yes. uh, a lot of these will actually be answered uh, in the due course, and then we will put up fresh questions across for you as well. Perfect. So as I take you to the next part of the session, which is going to be a little insight into yourself, maybe you can keep a pen and paper handy, or you can use the Excel sheet on your workbook or on your mobile phone, whatever is comfortable with you. I'm going to just start sharing screen. Now, this is the inside out section or the discovery or uncovering your interests. Uh, perhaps some of the professors at DY Patel have facilitated it for some of the students or it's part of your curriculum. Uh, but I will take you into uh, what is called as the Dr. John Holland's Magic Six. Uh, this is a, uh, a very interesting and a simple instrument uh, that normally we facilitate in our organization for our employees, children, between the age of say 13, 14, and uh, say, say 17 to 18, when they're in their ninth, 10th year of education, 11th, 12th year of education during those four years, because we believe that it's a, it's a great opportunity for you to understand your interests, understand what you would like to, uh, you know, understand what is your inner calling or what is that, that blessing that you've received as an individual, and that might just help you navigate into the right kind of career. This is probably a, a predecessor to uh, a nice counseling interaction. So if you can um, probably take this test and then go and have a discussion with some of your uh, you know, faculty leaders, some of your, uh, maybe if you, if you do have a personal counselor, that will be good. But what I'll do for you right now over the next four to five minutes is if you have a pen and paper handy, uh, I'm going to just move to the next screen, which will have about 11 elements 
under each of these six. R stands for realistic, I for investigative, A for artistic, S for social, E for enterprising, and C for conventional. So let's let's move to the next screen. You have about 11 options under each of this. The, the, the one thing I'd like to tell you is don't think too much. Uh, the first option that hits your head is the right option because it's coming to you subconsciously. Look at each of these 11 and just do a little tick mark or do a little tally stroke if you like doing it. The underlining statement here is I like doing it. So if you like fixing a car, say yes. If you would ask me, I'll say no get a mechanic to do it, but each one has a choice. So look at these 11 options and just start ticking the ones you like, after which we can total each one and get your highest score. I'm giving you about four minutes for this. There are 66 options here, probably three seconds for each options and then a little time for you to total them up. So uh, if there are no questions, it's fairly simple. I'll request you to take a shot at this. So get set, go. Find your RASIC score. If you have any questions with the language, please unmute and ask me. If they're fairly straightforward, but if there is a question, be happy to answer. Go through these 11 and tick the ones that you like. If you don't like it, keep them unticked or unchecked. Similarly, go through this. Tick the ones you like. Go through this. Tick the ones you like. Go through this. I have some of my family and friends also join the session. It will be good for you to participate there. There are young children. They, will, they would love to uh, get an insight into themselves. So can I ask a question? Please. Uh, so as a management student, as we are not uh, very uh, aware of the technologies that are coming in, like we are not technically skilled in that sense, uh, the 10 most important skills that you mentioned, how to stay relevant in the industry when uh, we are a core management student? Sure, sure. And I'll be happy to talk about that. I'll take that question. What's your name? Kostu, right. I'm just writing that down, Kostu. Sir, Kostu you... Gumuk. Yes. Yes, sir. We will talk about that probably during the end of the session. I've made a note of that. Once we complete, why don't you take a moment to complete this uh, this little diagnostic and we will take up that session, how to stay relevant. You. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Right, so I hope you would have probably come to the halfway mark, probably completed the, the third stage. Just look at it and you'll know whether you like it or you don't like it. Don't take it because your parents like it or your friends like it. Take it because you like it. And the more honest you are, the more honest uh, response you will get from this particular tool. Once you've gone through this and you can probably just quickly look to count your number of ticks and put a score under each box here. You can take a screenshot and save it with you. I will share this with your faculty members. I will share this with uh, Professor Swail, Dr. Juzare. They will be able to probably give you a little bit more insight into this particular tool.
I hope my good friend Praveen Raghavan is on this uh, session. He'll probably hope that we took this a little earlier in our lives. This is actually quite interesting. Take, take about 60 seconds to, to have you complete this particular. Can I request everybody to, on, to be on mute if you're not uh, participating in the session? Uh, Thank you. I must compliment you. You've been a wonderful audience. Uh, we we do a lot of online sessions at, at work and with other organizations. And sometimes it can be quite a task with this number of people to uh, to keep the decorum. So many congratulations to all the participants as well as the faculty members who developed this wonderful culture. Great. So I... I I'll request you to probably total down and you can put in your your first highest, second highest and third highest. If you if you have uh, one or two of them that are equal, you can put it down there as well. So you will probably, some of you will have realistic as the first highest, artistic as the second, enterprising as the third. Some of you may have investigative as the first, artistic as the second, conventional as the third. I was expecting one question, but I will still leave uh, that for uh, next 30 seconds, if somebody can ask me that question, because I said you need to look at each of them have 11 responses uh, that you need to give to get, be able to get the answer. I was hoping somebody will ask me a question. Okay, great. So if somebody can unmute and if Professor Sandeep can allow the, the rights, if you can raise your hand and tell us your top three and we'll probably take one or two just to give the, the entire audience a little perspective into what kind of you know, careers you can, you can look at when you, when you have a combination of these two and three. And uh, I have a small cheat sheet that I'll bring up, but we will, uh, and I'll share that with, uh, with our professors. So that you can use that as a, as a little guide. Hello, sir. This is Rakhi Ghosh. Yes, okay. uh, yeah, so I would like to take this opportunity. It was, it has been a very enlightened session indeed. And the top three, the highest was for me was artistic, followed by social, and the third highest was enterprising. Excellent. And Professor, uh, I can see that you 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 must be teaching in uh, uh, at DY Party. Yes. Yes. So you know it it doesn't come to you as a surprise that social definitely is one among them, and uh, maybe your sessions are known for extremely creative uh, uh, ways in which you bring out the concepts to students. Yes. Yeah. You must be really pushing them for for results. Uh, you must be getting them to apply a lot of the learnings as well. If you have a combination of uh, artistic, social, and right. yeah, we have an acronym for people. Well, we, we call them seafarers. You know, seafarers are the people who are uh, constantly posed with threats, and look, they look at it as an opportunity to be able to enrich themselves. That's All exciting. Right. I will send you a little cheat sheet because lack of time, uh, so that it's it's easy for the, the students to be able to look at their. Uh, you know, there are three codes. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. What kind of careers? Because uh, many students still have the opportunity to uncover themselves and look at some of these aspects as we as we going along. Um, yes. I'll tell you what. what um, uh, many people in HR probably started with conventional, uh, less social, more realistic. And today, what we're finding, uh, many of our colleagues, we're asking them to become more social more enterprising, more artistic. 
teachers today have to become more investigative in terms of using more opportunities to uncover the, the, the sciences that they have learned many years ago. I know that the, the, the medical fraternity had to go through a, a hugely investigative journey over the last two years to be able to relearn many of the aspects that they'd spoken about. Great, thank you. Uh, I'd like to now uh, ask Aarti to unmute herself and uh, Aarti Dhiman. Hello, sir. Hi, yes. this is Aarti here. Hi, Aarti. Um, yeah, in my, I got the first hires as social and the second highest was uh, investigative and the third highest was, a you know, it was in between conventional and realistic. Okay. Okay. Excellent. And Aarti, what is it that you're uh, probably seeing yourself doing maybe in the next three to five years? What is, uh, what is occurring to you as something that you're excited about? Um, so actually, uh, I am a professional teacher. And uh, I want to change my, uh, you know, career as a data analyst. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Interesting. And in fact, um, data is something that is rooted in convention uh, because it's got a lot of, um, it's got a lot of logic. It's got a lot of sciences. Um, and uh, career in data today uh, also has a very strong connotation with investigative and being realistic because uh, data in itself today has gone through a massive change, and you see that um, you know, in the in the ways the data is getting represented. It's not so much about throwing data up, but it's about having it the intelligence for people to make decisions out of it. So the last ten years was about uncovering data and throwing data up. That's not exciting anymore. We go through many uh, management presentations. We're saying it's fantastic that you have the data, but what are the top two or three decisions that we need to consider? So data scientists now have to make that little switch, that paradigm change in terms of saying that, what are they catering to? So it's not so much the accuracy, but it's actually the pragmatism of the data that's really being, uh, that's being appreciated today. Yes, sir. Uh, so actually uh, I did my mathematics honors. So, you know, when I did my mathematics honors, I was, you know, in towards statistics and, you know, I wanted to do masters in that. But that time there, were, uh, there was no scope of data and data analytics. It is now that we are looking forward to data anal analytics. Correct, correct. In fact, we have a role in our organization, which is called business excellence or operational excellence. I have the good fortune of working as a part of that team. And you have fantastic tools today, uh, you know, that are automated tools that can churn data, any amounts of data. But what we really look forward to that team is to be able to, as a part of that team, is to throw out solutions. So that requires um, both real world understanding as well as uh, data skills. When you bring both of them together, maybe your social skills will help you, you know, give you that real world understanding as well. Thank you, sir. So I will share this with you. I think you may, some of you may find it interesting and it's relevant at any stage of the career. It doesn't matter because, you know, it is a life of careers and not a career for life that we're looking at. Even within your same scope, whether you're a, you're a teacher or a medical, uh, uh, you know, expert or, you know, you could be in technology or you could be in human spaces or you could be in sales. There's a lot of change that can go through, you know. For example, I went from being somebody who was um, managing sales to be, to moving to somebody who taught sales. So I'm still within the sales industry or the sales organization, but uh, my role changed because of the kind of interests that I had. And I wish somebody had administered such a test for me at that point in time could have helped. I could have sh shown my boss the reason why I wanted to shift. That's, that's what we wanted to sort of give you as a perspective. And uh, maybe we'll take one more person and then we'll go on to our next segment because there's something interesting I'd like to do. Right. Uh, I'd now ask uh, Harshad to unmute himself. Harshad. Thanks, Soel, for the opportunity. And hi, Vinod. Uh, so first three highs. Uh, actually, I got two highs. Uh, uh, first one is realistic and another one is social. And interestingly, all the others came uh, coming into the third position. Okay. Um, so I think it's quite interesting and I would like to know <laughs> what does this mean? 
very good so you know uh, it's it's very interesting um, what you see on on the realistic side are things that are largely uh, psychomotor you know things that you do with your hands and with your bodily functions and what you see on the right hand side are things that you do to be able to help people so what is it that you do right now are you still a student or you're aspiring to do something i'm working professional i'm into it you're into it okay so uh, clearly the left hand side the realistic piece is there but what in it do you do do you do it services or it administration or software development what do you do uh it's business applications uh, uh support actually i i would develop and support as well you yeah, develop and support okay so one of the things that we find with a lot of software developers um is is their ability to understand domain and understand customer requirement so uh, when we work with uh, it services organization and developers we spend a lot of time to actually get them to understand what the end customer requirement is or what is it that's that true the domain yeah. requires so probably harshad with your social skills probably you can delve into that arena much faster where you're able to understand you know sometimes just asking somebody say what will make you happy if this works and if maybe innately you will be able to do that and they may be able to give you a response which might not be technical but you will know what the customer requirement uh, essentially is and perhaps using that as a front you will be able to develop uh, or be able to develop solutions uh, which will essentially be a more to people i think that that can be a tool or do you use that often is that an approach that you're already well uh, well aware of uh yes i mean uh, many of the things would you know come from experience itself like we would be using on some use cases and we can actually connect the, those dots um where it is actually narrowing down and what exactly the requirement is uh, but i never thought it from the perspective of being social or my my personality uh intends to or being social so this is something i am discovering today Okay. uh but yes uh, i would agree i'm very social very extrovert um and few things in that realistic list are exactly my hobbies uh, that i would do on every weekend uh, without fail great, great so okay. so this activity has actually helped me a lot to discover about myself fantastic ashad i'm glad that there is some discovery and you know that just makes <laughs> us feel happy another thing is probably you could make a good teacher as well if you hone your skill <laughs> yes yes i i love teaching too because um, i mean i like uh, uh, you know uh, teaching skills or my experience sharing my experience with the new joiners uh, you know to my uh, younger sisters brothers so i like being teacher as well uh, to okay. tell people uh, see that this is how you have to do or this is this is what i have learned from my experience and uh, i have convinced that this is the best way even though if i felt that uh, what i think was the best thing but later on i discovered realized no what i was thinking it wasn't the right most thing but this is the reality and the best practices that we need to um, take within ourselves so great. yes i like that position as well of becoming a teacher or a mentor great we look forward to you if you if you conduct any sessions please invite us yeah. <laughs> i believe i would spend most of the time to have you as my mentor to learn more and more <laughs> so it's a privilege and an honor thank you thanks well thanks you know great thank you thank you professor soel and professor sandeep for facilitating that uh, interactive session um i think we're down to our last leg uh, professor sandeep and professor sel can you give me an idea of how much time we have we have about a half an hour half an hour perfect that that fits the bill uh, what we'll do now is we'll go into a small little uh, quiz section it's it's a q and a um, for the better word i'd like i don't call it quiz but i'll let's try and look at some some management perspectives and some situations and the reason i put this here is sometimes you know if i were to give you too many perspectives it's just one way speak but what i wanted to do is let's engage into a little discussion so what you will see posed as questions are actually just discussion starters so that you know we get your views and we'll 
probably spend about three to four minutes on each question, about eight questions there. So we look to spend three to four minutes there. And then probably at the end of it, I'd like to give you a small little uh, concept and then that. And if there are any questions, we'll take that. So without further ado, I'll request you to go back into Mentimeter again. And uh, if you can look at this particular question, log on to menti.com, uh, use this code and give us your response. I'll keep this on for a moment while you all log in and I'll, then I'll switch to menti.com and start picking up the responses and we have a quick discussion on that. We've got eight questions uh, on various themes. So I'll, I'll read out the question. It says alphas. Alpha means also means is another word for leader. Uh, it's a gender agnostic term. So it doesn't mean male or female. So alphas in a group get preferential treatment as a result of a psychological contract that in return promises the group what? That's the, that's the question. The very important aspect as you enter organizations. So read the question. In the meantime, uh, you use menti.com and go into and type the code double four double eight eight one six five. We leave this here for about 15 seconds or so, and then I'll switch to menti.com, start looking at others. Last time we had close to about 150 odd people who responded. Let's see if we can keep that number or even increase that. We'll request everybody to participate. This is very easy. Just have to get into the menti.com, leave that code and you can give your response. Let me switch to the portal. I'm going to share the screen. I'm glad to see that some people, some of you have already started responding. That's very good. Arti says done. Let me say thank you to Arti. This is how it's a, it's a very realist, a real time uh, movement that you're seeing in terms of responses. We've got about 32 responses. We'll give this exactly 45 seconds. So that we can use of our time. Okay, we've got about 47 responses. I'll give it about 15, 20 more seconds and then we will discuss this. Okay, good. So we got a good amount of responses, and what we what we see here as a distribution is that you most of you have gone towards a leader uh, in a hierarchy as well as collective identity. That's good because that is conventional thinking in terms of saying that um, if you do become an alpha in a group, you become a leader. There is a psychological contract, an automatic psychological contract that happens with the team, and um, many of the leaders get their position and they're promised a hierarchical position and what the people look for in many cases. Let me give you an example. Uh, 
when we had uh, the COVID situation and it broke out, the leaders who were given alphas or the preferential treatment or who are the leaders in the group, when as followers of that particular team, could be part of a state, it could be part of a country, what is it that we were really looking for? Or the team or the people who are part of that particular group we were looking for is definitely one of the aspects could be identity, one of the aspects could be collective identity, one could be leaders. But what you're really looking for is protection when there is danger. So probably a corollary to this is that when you are bestowed with the um, opportunity of becoming a leader and you are made a leader by the team, one of the uh, you know corollaries to that is what they are looking forward to is protection. Uh, many of the team members I work with, uh, actually one of the things that they look forward from me is to be able to handle situations that are putting them under threat, putting them in danger, putting them in discomfort. And that's what the next level leadership is supposed to do. That's what my next level leader does. Um, he fronts most of the uh, you know, so-called bullets and arrows that are coming in and helps uh, keep me shielded to the capacity that I can handle and so on and so forth. So that becomes one of the most important aspects. I'm glad that uh, some of you have chosen this and it's it's important as you rise in your career as leaders to be able to know that um, as family members, when you are the elder one, what do the younger ones really look forward to? They want that sense of safety. They want that sense of security. So that's what this question was uh, meant to decipher and as a as a little bit of uh, an insight into what the industry leadership expectation is when you get into that kind of a role. And it'll be a few years later, but this will help you sort of uh, develop that kind of, uh, you know, uh, that kind of nature, that kind of nurture, that kind of nature to be able to help you become a better leader, right? Great. Let's go to the next question. And if you, if you look at your tab, you will probably see that there is, I'm just gonna to switch to the next question here. You can use the same code and uh, it will tell you that the presenter has switched to the next screen. You can say yes. And that's the question that is um, there for you, which says culture is a set of habits that a group practices. However, how is a habit formed? Great, so we've got some responses. Great, so we'll take about 45 seconds for the next set of responses and then we'll discuss this. I'll encourage everybody to participate. There is no right answer, there is no wrong answer and all your responses are anonymous. None of us have any clue what you're responding to. So feel free to respond, that's the best way to learn about 30 seconds more. Very nice. We've got we've got a good, healthy set of responses, and I'm I'm very happy to see that most of you are thinking in the right direction. You know, while appreciation helps nurture a set of habits, the real aspect of developing a habit is what you're speaking about. I'll give you a, uh, an example. This is a popular story which is told by one of our leading consultants. He says that uh, my partner has this habit of uh, you know chewing candy. So when he goes with his wife to the, uh, to the uh, vegetable market, he uh, would unwrap his candy, pop the candy into his mouth. And where do you think the wrapper will go? The natural guess is it will go into the rubbish that is part of the vegetable market. This happens on a Sunday. On a Monday, when he's going to meet a potential client, a CEO of another organization, 
in a large firm, maybe the lobby of a five-star hotel, he still has a habit of, you know, popping the candy. He likes popping candy. But once he pops his candy and he sees that, that little piece of wrapper, where do you think that will go? He will probably go around scurrying, looking for a garbage can and put that in. So, you know, that's a, a very simple take on how a, how a habit is formed. Another piece of research that told me is go into the living room of uh, a family and just look at where the chairs are pointed at. That will tell you what is the favorite habit of the family. So if it's all pointed at the TV, that means the greatest habit is to watch TV. And uh, if you have a dining table, which is in the, uh, which is in another room, or it's in a garden or in a balcony, that will also tell you what is the habit uh, that the family follows. We know many families who don't watch TV while, while eating, but we know many families that actually look forward to uh, eating while watching uh, TV. So the, the first aspect, like you said very correctly, is about noticing. It's about noticing whether that habit is giving you positive results or it's giving you results that you don't want. And in order to be able to change that, the key is to be able to change the environment that forms that habit. And the more you nurture, in fact, many people say, what comes first, the habit or the environment? And I'll leave for you to look at that. Change the environment and the habit changes or change the habit and the environment changes. Think about this for a moment and you'll probably see that as you change the environment, the same person who practiced something in the vegetable market has changed it when he's practiced, he's gone to a five-star hotel. Day after tomorrow, when he sees that probably chewing the candy is giving him not so helpful health results, maybe that habit could also change. So it's about bringing to attention about what you want uh, but, and then to be able to do that repetitively and start getting the rewards. So the appreciation, the rewards, we normally plug in as an organization, we plug in the reward mechanism a little later in the in the hierarchy where we try and appreciate when people have started noticing, wanting and doing what uh, is the right kind of habit that we want them to form. And the appreciation then builds that, that likeliness to continue that habit. So excellent, a big round of applause to all of you. I think this is this is absolutely fantastic. 44 out of 73 have picked up the right chord. And this is going to be important. So somebody said, you know, how do you stay relevant? How do you navigate change? This is going to be very important. That change of habit formation is going to be extremely important. We, we tried this in our organization and it's worked. It takes time, but uh, it's really worked. So great. So that's two questions out of eight that I had for you. I'm going to bring up the remaining questions for you. I need to just quickly go to the next presentation set. Give me a moment. So I'm bringing up the next two questions for you. Stay on menti.com. You'll get a couple of, you'll get a new code, which you'll need to enter. Just go back to menti.com and I'll give you another code. I'm sharing screen. I think at this point in time, you'll be able to see the screen now. Yes, but there is menti.com. There's a new code here. You can enter the new code and you'll see this question pop up on your screen. It says, if one of your co-workers derives his, her or his motivation by discussing their thoughts in the open, they're more likely to be. And those are your four responses. Right. So you have four responses. I have 10 responses now. Let's give this another 45 seconds to see how the group is thinking about this. I must say your participation is very encouraging. This is that much that we can bring into the session and the energy that we get is largely uh, due to your participation. I thank you for that.
very good. That's excellent responses. I apologize for that typo there. It's extroverted and not extroverted. It's supposed to be E X T R A V E R T E D, and you you recognize that uh, the right way. Um, so, what if somebody derives his or her motivation by discussing their thoughts in the moment? Absolutely, they're likely to be extroverted, and probably uh, your professors can give you a. Uh, personality assessment that will help you understand whether you're extroverted or, or introverted. And that will be the first step to probably building good relationship with your co-workers. The, 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 use, the, the uh, flip side to it is that extroverted people can be over-friendly, they can be a little boastful, and they can be gossipers as well. But this is largely what you need to de decipher is that when people uh, derive their energy, they derive their motivation by discussing their thoughts in the open, they're extroverted. When they derive their energy through reflection, through deep thinking, through, uh, you know, the, uncovering it within themselves, they are introverted. So this is a uh, good, good response from all of you here. The reason why we pose this question is, as you uh, would have seen, some of the top skills uh, that are going to be in vogue for the next five years require for us to collaborate. And I've seen two kinds of collaboration. One is transactional collaboration, whereas I need to do, get something out of you, you need to get something out of me, we need to work together. And hence, it becomes very transactional. Um, that doesn't last the test of time. When you're working together with someone, if you really understand what drives them, and whether and one, one key way would be to be able to understand whether they're extroverted or introverted. One of the key things is, you will see that introverted people, when you start making very good friends with them, they actually open up to you. And you might wonder, I thought this person was introverted all along, but he's, an ex he's, an, he's, an, he's extremely uh, talkative. Um, I still remember uh, no, Javagal Srinath, my father and I love this story, the, the cricketer uh, interviewing uh, VVS Lakshman. And he said that, you know, all through his career, VVS Lakshman never spoke a word. But the moment they gave him a mic as a journalist, he said, Ye to lamba lamba chhodta hai. You know, the guy never stops talking because probably an introvert in him got so comfortable with the environment that he started expressing himself very, very well. So probably understanding the motivation of your colleagues will help you better build more transformational relationships. That's why we pose this question. Great. Very good response. Thank you very much for that. Let's go to the next question. Retain the code and it will automatically take you to the next question. This is an open-ended question. The code remains the same. It'll probably say the presenter has switched the screen. And that's a question for you. It says a bat and a ball together cost 110. If the difference in cost is 100, how much does the bat and ball cost respectively? That is independently. How much does the bat cost and how much does the ball cost? To respond to this, give me bat is equal to so much. Ball is equal to so much. So somebody has said five each. So think through that. Very good. I'm, I'm really happy somebody responded so quickly. Can we have a few more responses? Five each. So it's a bat and a ball together cost 110 rupees. The bat is 100 and the ball is 10. Very good. Let's have more responses. Five each. Bat is worth 10. Ball is worth equal. You've got five each. 100. 10, just put, put the two qualifiers to test. Add the two figures that you think, if they come to 110, subtract them. If they come to 100, you will get the right cost. So I've given you a little clue. Uh, look at the others as well. Very nice. For 25 responses here. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> Somebody says ball free with the ball or bat free with the ball. I've got eight out of 40 responses. I've got eight correct responses so far. Fantastic. So eight of you have got the response right. And I'll give you a little perspective into this. So 
guide 47. We'll look for two more responses and then we'll go through. I hope you're able to see all the responses while I'm scrolling up and down the screen. Yeah, 50, 50th question. Perfect. So we've got 50 and I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, nine out of 55 have got the response, right? Which is a good rate. Normally we see 10 to 20% of the, um, you know, and the people get the response, right? So just to give you a quick uh, uh, answer solution to this, the right answer is not 110, which is the most popular answer that we get. The right answer is 105 and five, because if you add 105 and five, you get 110. If you subtract five from 105, you get 100. So big round of applause to all the people who got it right. You can give yourselves a pat on the back because this is normally uh, the trend that we see. Now, just to give you a perspective to this and why we introduced this board, this uh, this question. Um, see, one of the skills that are going to be very important as we go forward is the skill of problem solving. And when we talk about problem solving, there is a two hat theory that uh, psycholo psychologists talk about is the hot theory and the cold theory. So psychologists say that the hot theory is the penchant of the mind to go towards the solution that comes to you first. And the fact that you see 110, 100, somewhere the mind subconsciously processes 110 as the right answer. But if you were to look at the qualifiers, it qualifies for second for the first qualifier, which says the total should be 110, but it doesn't qualify for the second one because if you subtract 10 from 100, it will be 90. The code theory says that you look at a question, you look at all the options and you sit down probably with a pen and a paper or you try and break it down mentally so that you can get to the right answer. Problem solving uh, is one of the unstated future skills that is going to be uh, in front of all of us. Because uh, like we said, we are best out with a lot of knowledge. There's a lot of knowledge out there. There's a lot of literature out there. There's a lot of study out there. But every day you're going to come up with a new problem. The pandemic is a classic case of a problem that nobody could think of. Similarly, in the organization space, whether you're in business or you're working as a part of an organization or you're leading an organization, you're going to come up with problems that you've not faced before. The issue with those is that you tend to go back to the solution that you're most comfortable with. And many times that can be the detriment between making a right decision and a wrong decision. And we've learned this through some of our, uh, you know, senior mentors in the organization, because as, as people who are part of, uh, you know, growing management group, we tend to want to offer solution very quickly. And many of our senior leaders will say, you know what, Vinod, just think through it because you're coming with baggage that you've already acquired over a period of time, but this will probably need for you to think a little. So that's why we brought this question here saying that when you get a problem, try and work it out and that helps you uh, arrive at the right equation. So great, so we've reached the halfway stage. I hope you're finding this interesting. I'm just gonna go back and uh, bring up the next set of questions. These are the last four questions that we have. Right. Okay, I'm going to give you, now these two questions are going to be important from an interview preparation point of view. Now, some of you may be going to organizations for interviews, so I added a couple of questions, which I thought could be useful in case you are preparing for an interview tomorrow, right? So, I'm going to share, and that's question five of six for you. That's your question. You can see that there's a different code for Mentimeter. Go to menti.com and plug in this code now. It says when an interview asks you, interviewer asks you whether you have any weakness or what's your biggest weakness, what are they looking to uncover? You have four options here. Choose the option that you most. Two responses, great. You seem to be very fast. This shows that you're adaptable. This shows that you're quick. Great. Very nice. 
updates. So we got 30 responses. We'll give it another 15 seconds till we hit that magic mark of 50. Very nice. Excellent, excellent. I think great responses. I think kudos to the fact that none of you chose the fact that they want to put you down. So that's fantastic. Uh, and this is this is very, very important that interviewers ask you when whether you have a weakness and what is your biggest weakness, essentially, for all those three reasons you've chosen. The fact that you're self-aware, the fact that you are honest, and the fact that you do have a development plan in mind to be able to overcome that weakness. The one answer that's a wrong answer here is to say that I don't have any weakness. So say that I've arrived and the next big thing and saying that you don't have a weakness is probably the wrong thing to do. In addition to that, I'd like to suggest one or two things that you know I came across when, when I was preparing here, saying that one or two things you probably shouldn't say that your weakness is. It's good to be honest, but you also want to be self-regulated. You know, It's probably not very good to say that you don't have, you don't manage time well or you can't ma manage multiple tasks, or you can't work with people. Because these are the three things that are going to be a given when you come into the industry. The fact that you know you need to manage projects on time, you need to manage your time, you need to manage others' time, basic discipline, reporting to work, all of that becomes extremely essential. The fact that multiple tasks can get thrown your way, it's very difficult to say that you, know, you can't handle it or work with people. Two or three weaknesses that are good to say is that, you know, is that you find it difficult to give feedback. You don't like how to, you don't want to hurt somebody else's feelings. So you don't like to give feedback to somebody. Or that you say that you're too detail oriented that you can't complete your task. That's fine. You know, these are two, three things which are, which sit well within the, within the bracket of your weaknesses. I think if you explore this area along with your professors, you can get something really good. But I'm glad that you picked the right answers here and 71 people have responded. That's fantastic. I'm going to go to the second question as a part of your interview prep question. You can stay on the same code and the screen will change. Yeah, sorry. Same code, screen changes. It says, when an interviewer asks you, why do you want to work for us? What are they looking to uncover? Very nice, fantastic responses from everybody. Yes, yes, very good. Fantastic, so we've got 50 responses, that's our magic marker, and we will look at. So when you are uh, posed this question from an interviewer, uh, you are right, they are looking at the opportunity and your interest alignment, but that is probably one of the aspects they're looking for at the second stage. It's your interest versus the opportunity. So that's more from your aspect of connecting with the organization and with the, the job at hand. Career clarity, yes, that's one thing they're definitely looking for, that that's good. But one of the things they're also looking for is your research that you've done on the company. How much do you know about the organization? And from there, if you can connect to what your interests are, what your skill sets are, and what you want to do long-term in terms of a career, that gives the interviewer a, uh, a full panorama. And now I want to ask you, when they ask you all of this, aren't they looking for your communication ability as well? So that's an area probably that is a discovery for you is many questions that are asked during an interview, not only are what meets the eye, but it also is about what doesn't meet the eye or what you read between the lines. This is where the interviewer is really looking at about how you logically sequence? What's your thought process? How do you connect with the interviewer? How are you expressing yourself? Are you talking about feelings or facts? These are all decided through your communication abilities. So that's also an important aspect. So as we, as we come to the last two questions, that is the exact area that we're going to talk about. The last two questions I'm going to bring up. And this will be probably the conclusion of our session as well, the right on marker. 
you will get a new mentimeter code this is around the area of communication i'm going to share screen now got a new mentimeter code there and it says that when you make a presentation or a public speech or it could be an interview response what is the objective so you have three options there correct great so we've got some responses going very quick I'll wait for the 50 marker. We're coming very close to it. Fantastic. I think we've got about uh, 50 odd responses now. Most of you seem to veer towards conveying information. Some of you are talking about engaging the audience and least of you are talking about influencing behavior. One of the key shifts or changes in presentation and public speech is if you were to step back and see, why is that speaker talking to you? It is less about conveying information, but it's more about influencing behavior, which is done through engagement of the audience. Think about a statesman or an organization leader or even a movie, there is a larger message behind that. And the message is to probably help us to practice certain kind of uh, behavior. And you, you talk about uh, you know some of the popular movies that you've seen. So for example, there was uh, this movie called uh, Mission Mangal. So was it to be able to convey information to us on how a, a rocket is to be launched into, into space? Or was it more about engaging the audience and then getting us to influence behavior. When the prime minister spoke to us during the lockdown, he said that imagine that there is a Lakshman Rekha that has been put across your door and you are not meant to cross that. It's not so much about telling us about what coronavirus does. There are other people to be able to do that. But largely as you move into making presentations or public speeches, think about what the audience is going to do with that information and hence you will start to look at ways of how that information can first engage your audience because you're not going to change any behavior until the audience starts listening to you they listen to you they accept your thoughts of you and that can influence your change in behavior so here is an area that probably needs for you to revisit to look at the the, the real reason or go a little, dwell a little deeper into why presentation or public speeches are, are made, whether you can you listen to Martin Luther King's speeches or you listen to Mahatma Gandhi's speeches or you the Nelson Mandela speech, listen to any sports leader, listen to any political leader, listen to Barack Obama, you see that there is always an intent to influence a certain kind of behavior. I'm not talking about political speeches. And we're, not, we're not here to talk about that, but any other speech which is meant to influence behavior. So great. So this is an opportunity probably you can visit as a group. Again, 70 responses. So thank you for that. And here's the last question for the day. We, we just spoke about that engaging the audience is extremely crucial when you're a speaker. The last question for the day. So let's get our responses in quickly. Fantastic, as we hit the 50 mark, very happy to hear that you've, you've all chosen a very beautiful response, which is 
making it useful and, and beneficial to them. That's going to be extremely important. Fantastic. And that's, that's probably a great way to be able to end this session today is that as speakers, as public presenters, many of you are going to have the opportunity to influence the way uh, many people are going to make decisions. Many of you are come practicing medicine and you will go on to become management professionals in medicine. Many people will come to you. And sometimes it's easy to dazzle people in abstract terms. Um, I know a doctor that we take uh, my father to and we consult him on everything, Dr. Avias Suresh from Continental. I think he does a great way of uh, changing abstract terminologies into elements that make it beneficial for uh, for us to be able to understand. So I'm so happy that you know you you hit the ball out of the park on the last question, and it's absolutely right. Think of it, uh, you know how it becomes beneficial, and derive the concepts from what they already already know, and that makes your audience engaged as well as help in to be able to take that action that you want to take. So. I think at this point in time, I think we've we've probably uh, hit the closing mark. I thank you so much for being such a wonderful, participative audience, such a curious audience, and extremely disciplined and focused. And I think it's a great honor for, for me and for all of us to be associated with you. Um, it, you. I can't tell you how much of a privilege it has been to be able to facilitate this session. Once again, thank the entire management of D.Y. Patil and uh, all the literati who have together this program and over to you professor sohail and dr jusari thank you so much sir. thank you so much. thank you so much uh, mr krishnan it was um, that was so much insight from you you know um it is actually my privilege to propose this word of thanks on this bay wave series um on behalf of dr dy patil with their beat center for online learning pune um, and the entire team, I would like to extend this word of thanks to you, Mr. Uh, Vinod Krishnan, uh, for gracing your thoughts and insights with us, um, with your experience and wisdom on the important aspect of our corporate lives that we, you know, our learners are going to actually experience going forward from here. Uh, we have been hearing about various skills that are needed to excel and ace the corporate life, but um, how to go about it uh, was the most important aspect and uh, the situation after the pandemic uh, kind of changed a lot of things. Um, some, some skills became obsolete, some became more important and some are actually growing, uh, you know, to be what you need to ace that, uh, uh, you know, ace the corporate behavior aspect. So uh, through your experience, Mr. Krishnan, we have gone through a lot of examples and the key values and competencies and becoming a better leader, a better manager. Um, thank you, sir. It was a lot of delight to hear you. Uh, I would like to extend my thanks to our entire leadership team. Uh, I didn't know him there, Dr. P. D. Patil, sir, Dr. Pagesh Shima, uh, Pawar, sir, um, uh, Dr. Smith Azadal, ma'am, Dr. Faruqi, ma'am. Um, and our dear learners to be such a beautiful uh, audience and an active participative audience um, and all the faculty members as well. With this, I would declare the session as closed. Thank you, everyone.